Today, we're going to start a new series. I have the honor to start a new series with you guys for the next two weeks called About Family, and it's called Picture Perfect. And so my hope over our time together is to talk about family and a lot of things that go along with that. But in order to get our mind in the right place, in order to get our, just our brains fired up and clicking on all cylinders, I have a little activity, all right? You ready to play a game? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> you guys ready to play a game with me? I mean, come on. That's what, that's what I wanted the first time. All right, so here's what we're going to do. In a moment, you're going to see pictures of famous television families that are going to come on screen. Your job is to name the family, not the show, the family, as quickly and as loud as possible. You understand? Are you ready? All right, here's our first family. If you're like me, you're singing the song in your head right now. <laughs> Seventh heaven. The Camdens, that's it. The Camdens from seventh heaven. Man, that was, that was a Monday night ritual in my family. We would sit down and watch seventh heaven. All right, you ready for the second one? Yeah. Now, again, as soon as you see this picture, the theme song is going to just happen. But ignore that, fight that, and think of the family name. Here's the second picture. Dum, da dum, 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 dum. The Banks. The Banks from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Now, how many of you guys could go with the whole theme song right now? <laughs> yeah. I've thought about just making that the sermon for the day, not even telling you, just having it open up to the book of John. This is a story all about how my life got twist turned upside down. <laughs> that would have been fun, right? All right, here's our third family. Ooh. Wow. I was expecting that one to be hard, man. But yeah, all you old folk, boom, the Keatons. <laughs> Alex P. Keaton. It's really not that old. All right. Number four. <sighs> that was supposed to be the trick question. You were supposed to say the Cosbys. You're good. You guys are good. The Huxtables from the Cosby Show. I've got one more. This, this one will be a quick one. The Tanners from Full House. Isn't that, wasn't that such a great show? Yeah, that was a great show. Uh, I, I, I watched that all the time on TGIF and then whenever it was moved. And I still watch every once in a while on Nick at Night or whatever that channel is. But I'm very impressed with your guys' skills to answer these questions. Uh, again, we're starting a series based on family called Picture Perfect. And so getting into that, let me just kind of share something with you that happens to me. I don't know if this happens to you. Maybe I'm alone in this and I'm okay with that. Have you guys ever had to shop for a picture frame? So you go to the store, right? And you have to find the picture frame aisle. And then I get to the picture frame aisle and then I'm just kind of overwhelmed with all the different sizes of frames, all the different styles of frames. But here's what I'm doing and this is why I might be weird. Beyond looking at just the size and the style of the frames, I'm looking at the pictures that the companies put in the frames. You know what I'm talking about? The stock photos that are already in there. And what I find myself doing is just, I get to a very sad and sarcastic place and I just kind of laugh at myself. Like, <laughs> that's, that, that's not real, right? So maybe you're familiar with pictures like this one. You know, you got the perfect family. <laughs> They're at the beach. They got the American dream going on, right? They got the one son, the one daughter. They're just running along the shore, and they're laughing and having a glorious time with their perfect white teeth and their perfect white clothing, right? And then here's what I'm thinking to myself. I don't even know the last time I had a plain white shirt. I may have bought it that way, but over time with juice and black beans or whatever else my children eat, it's all over. It's stained. So I kind of look at that, and I just kind of laugh, and okay, whatever. Well, maybe you're familiar with a picture like this one. And again, to me, this picture says, <laughs> sorry, we're just having a great time. We're, you know, we're just giving our kids piggybacks on our perfectly healthy, pain-free backs. Oh, 
I'm sorry. Did you need sunglasses to shade your eyes from our radiant smiles, you know? And like the only thing missing from this picture-perfect family is a golden Labrador retriever with a stick in his mouth chasing them, you know? And, and I just find myself looking at these pictures and I laugh because I don't know any families that look like that. At least mine doesn't. And I'm sure that you're thinking that yours doesn't either. I think if we're being honest, our photos would look more like this one. You know, we can't get our kids to collect themselves and behave and get in place, and so you duct tape them to the window like they did that little kid. <laughs> like, that's probably more along the lines of what your family's like. <laughs> or maybe your family photos resemble more like this lady's. The story here is that she got divorced and went through her photo albums and completely whited out her ex-husband in every single picture. And so maybe for you, you've got family photos where you're thinking, man, I just wish I could wipe that person out. I wish that I could just remove them, forget them, and pretend they never existed. See, I think we all grow up with this picture of what a perfect family looks like in our head. We look to the Cosby Show, we look to Full House, we look to Family Ties, and begin to think that that is what the perfect family looks like. Or sometimes we put, to, we put together this picture of the ideal family by looking around the people in our lives. We latch on to this projected image we get from our peers or our friends or people we don't even know all that well, but who appear to have it all together when it comes to their relationship with their parents, their siblings, and children. And what I've learned over the last few years is that Facebook and Instagram doesn't help either. I like what Pastor Stephen Furtick says about our culture in regards to uh, our self-esteem and, and, and how self-conscious we are in comparing ourselves. He said that part of our problem is we're comparing our behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reel. Our social media, the social media we see reels of what appears to be perfect family. We see these highlight reels of perfect family moments taken on perfect family vacations or during perfect family occasions. And we wish that our family could be more like that one, but we know that's impossible because we know what goes on behind the scenes in our stories. We look around at all of these picture-perfect families and we look at ours and we realize that our family is not so perfect. You see that your relationship with your brother or sister, your mom or dad, your step-parent, your child, your aunt, your uncle, your grandmother or grandfather, your ex-husband or ex-wife is off. And that relationship and that tension and that chaos has shattered your picture-perfect family. Maybe your mother or father walked out when you were young and you grew up with a single mom or a single dad. Maybe someone stole from you in your family. Perhaps you were in business with your brother and sister and things went wrong. Maybe you're divorced and things with your second family is going great, but there is tension and strain between you and your first family. Maybe your child has left home and has taken up the prodigal lifestyle. And you look at your picture of your family and wish that it could be different. You wish it could be like all of those other picture-perfect families. But here's the truth for us all today. No one's family is perfect. In fact, I bet that if you were to walk up to and talk to one of those perfect families, that they would admit that there are some pretty glaring flaws in their family as well. And that's just because families are complex. They're filled with flawed people. So we need to expect dysfunction in our families. And so today and next week, we're going to talk about how do we function in our family's dysfunction? How do we find the good in the midst of our family's mess? So one of the things I'd like to encourage you with this morning is that God has determined your family and your place in it for a purpose. It is no coincidence that you, you are in the family you are in, whether by birth, adoption, marriage, etc. 
it's no coincidence. God has you there for a reason. I'm reminded of what Paul taught the Greeks in Acts 17, 26. This is what he said. From one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And listen to this second part here. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. So Paul is teaching that there is a God so big, there is a God so powerful who is sovereign and has insight and care and intention when it comes to the earth as a whole, but also to you. You as a junior in high school. You as a child of divorced parents. You as a mother or father. You as someone with frustration towards your family. God sees and God knows. And so Paul is saying, God has put you exactly as you are, exactly where you are, exactly when you are for a reason. He has determined your family and your place in it. And to say that God has determined these things isn't to say that he is punishing you by placing you where you are or that he did it just so he could watch you suffer in the place he has put you in. Instead, to say that God determined this is to say that God is involved. God is watching. God is present. God is in the details. He's in your details. God, is, God sees your dysfunction and your unhappiness. Sounds good, right? But now what? So God determined things to be this way. God puts you where you are. But what does this mean for you? I think it means that you should do what only you can do. In your family, in your current circumstances, that you should do what only you can do. Because you are uniquely made by God, placed in a very unique family, going through unique situations. So you should do what only you are uniquely able to do. I'm reminded of an event that took place in Egypt around the 1800s B.C. You may be familiar with this event in history. Thank you to Donny Osmond going to Broadway and taking along his Technicolor, amazing Technicolor dream coat. Okay? This morning we're going to talk about Joseph. Now to fully get Joseph's story, we have to start at the same place you would have to start if someone was going to tell any of our stories with our parents. Joseph's parents were Jacob and Rachel. And let me just say that the drama in their family is way worse than the drama in yours. And I don't even have to know what's going on in your family to know that this is true. Jacob was married to two women, Leah and Rachel. And in addition, he had two maidservants who didn't quite have the privileges of a wife, but were part of the family nonetheless. Now, Scripture tells us that it was no secret that Rachel was the favored wife. She was the wife that Jacob loved. But in an ironic twist of fate, she was also the one that couldn't have any children. Leah and the two maidservants had no trouble at all giving Joseph sons and a daughter. But Rachel was a different story. Until Genesis tells us that God remembered Rachel, listened to her, and gave her a son, and that son was Joseph. So to recap, there's one dad, four moms. While there are multiple children born from each of the wives, it is Rachel, the favored wife, who gives birth to Joseph, who clearly becomes the favorite child. Now, this is not just a matter of assumption. This is not a matter of just how you interpret the scriptures. The Bible is extremely clear. The Bible actually says that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. The Bible made that extremely clear. And I'm sure you could say that he was spoiled, maybe doted on, probably got away with a lot more and had special privileges his brothers never had. And it doesn't even seem like Jacob tried to hide the fact that he liked Joseph more. In fact, he gave Joseph a gift, a beautiful cloak. And the brothers, seeing their father's favoritism, hated Joseph. We are told they couldn't even speak a kind word to Joseph. You starting to feel sorry for Joseph a little bit? Well, hold that a little bit, because he wasn't exactly one for tact. Joseph was a dreamer. 
He was known for his dreams. And while the dreams are sort of cryptic, it's fairly obvious to anyone who heard them that they represented something that would put his brothers on the edge. Listen to what Genesis says. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Just a little tip here, siblings. If you have a dream that involves your brothers bowing down to you and worshiping you, you keep that a secret. <laughs> you may not want to tell them that. So it's not a surprise that the brothers were ticked. And they responded to Joseph with sarcasm and even more hatred. But Joseph doesn't stop there. He has another dream. And this time it involves the sun and moon and stars bowing down to him. And so now things are starting to get awkward. And the brothers are getting so jealous that they can't even see straight. So jealous they can't even think straight because their jealousy, in, in their jealousy they created a plot to kill Joseph. So here's what happens. One day the brothers see Joseph coming down towards them wearing his beautiful coat that the father had given him. It's this obvious symbol that says that my father loves me so much more than he loves you. And so what do the brothers do? The first thing they do, they rip his coat off, they throw him into an empty well, and they leave him there for dead. After throwing Joseph in the well, his brothers sit down for lunch, right? That just seems normal. What do you do after you kill your brother? You go out to get a quick bite to eat and just kind of think about it for a little bit. And while they're out having lunch, they see a band of Ishmaelites traveling to Egypt. And they begin to rethink what they've done. But instead of feeling guilty for their actions, they realize that they can actually gain more from Joseph's life by selling him than they can by leaving him to die. They even have the nerve to say this in Genesis 37, 26. What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our own brother, <laughs> our own flesh and blood. So what they're saying essentially is, he's our brother. So if anybody should have to benefit, if anybody should profit, it, we should be the ones to get something for his life. It should be us. He is our brother. We should be the ones to gain from him. So Joseph's brothers sell him to the Ishmaelites, who take him to Egypt to be sold as a slave. Now, I'm just going to say this. The story gets even more wild from here. And so I encourage you to go home and read Genesis 37 and keep going because the story is wild. It's one of my favorites. But we're going to kind of take a jump here in a little bit, okay? So the brothers leave or sell Joseph off into slavery. But there's still the issue of what do they tell their dad? Because the father is not just going to not notice his favorite son isn't coming home. So they have to come up with something so they take Joseph's coat, the coat that was Joseph's pride and joy, made for the son who was their father's pride and joy, and they kill a goat, smearing blood all over the coat to make it look like an animal attacked Joseph. And then they take that coat to their father, telling him that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. Fortunately, that's not how Joseph's story ends. While in Egypt, in a Again, a couple of crazy scenarios and situations happen. Joseph works his way up through Pharaoh's regime. Then Pharaoh starts having some dreams. And Joseph is the only one able to interpret them. So essentially, Pharaoh's dreams are foretelling a time when Egypt will go through a severe famine. So Joseph tells Pharaoh, save up for the famine because you're going to need this food for later. And Pharaoh does what Joseph says. But not everyone in every nation has the foresight Joseph has. So when the famine hits, people come from all over the world and they travel to Egypt for food. And Joseph gets put in charge of distributing the food to the people who come. And if this doesn't make for a good story, 
I don't know what does. Because guess who comes to Egypt looking for food? Yes, Joseph's brothers. Now, this should be interesting because remember, Joseph's brothers at this point have no idea where Joseph is. For all they know, Joseph is dead. And here's the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that upon taking his leadership position, when he's like the second in command in Egypt, so he's a big dog in Egypt, Pharaoh changes his name to Zaphnath paneah I call him Big Z. It's just easier that way. So if anyone were going to come to Egypt, there's no record of this Joseph fellow anymore because he's now Big Z. He's the big dog in charge right under Pharaoh. Now let's get back to the story. Genesis 42 tells us that when Joseph's father, Jacob, hears that there's grain in Egypt, he chastises his sons and tells them to hit the road and get their family some food. However, Jacob holds back the other son that Rachel, his favorite wife, had given him, named Benjamin, because he's afraid something might happen to him. Obviously, the memory of what happened to Joseph is not far from Jacob's mind. So when the brothers arrive to Egypt, Joseph is the one appointed by Pharaoh to distribute the food to them. Joseph is now in a position of power over his brothers who don't even realize who he is. However, when the brothers come and they bow before him, can you imagine how great that must have been for him to have his brothers bow before him? I had a dream about that one time, right? <laughs> Joseph recognizes them, so he knows that that's his brothers, but he pretends to be a stranger and speaks harshly to them saying, where do you come from? And he says, I know who you are. I know you're spies. And so they start freaking out. Now, if this were a movie, you would bet, you could bet that this is the climax. This is the point where everything's on the line. This is the defining moment when everything hangs in the balance. This is that scene in Rocky II where Adrian just wakes up from her coma. And she just told Rocky, I will never support you. Don't fight, don't fight. She wakes up from her coma, looks Rocky in the eyes and says, there's one thing I want you to do for me. Win, win. <laughs> Train, uh, cue the training montage, right? This is the point in Lion King where Simba decides that he is no longer going to let his evil Uncle Scar ruin Pride Rock, and I'm going to go home and fight for the right to rule it. This is the scene in Star Wars Episode Five, The Empire Strikes Back, where Darth Vader says his famous line, I am your father. And Luke Skywalker, after all of his father trying to convince him to join the dark side, says, No, I will never join you. And what does he do? He jumps off into this deep, dark hole. But that moment forever changes the storyline of that trilogy, at least the one that matters. <laughs> and that is the kind of tension we are feeling right now. The history of Joseph and his family is hanging in this moment, this one defining moment. What is Joseph thinking when he sees his brothers? What's he going to do? How is he going to respond? This is important because his response has the power to change everything. Though Joseph recognizes his brothers and has the power to repay them for what they had done to him so many years before, he understands that he has a decision to make in response to this situation. He's in a very powerful and unique situation. And while he may have been powerless when they sold him into slavery, he now has the power to make his brothers pay and seek revenge. What Joseph does next is both shocking and a little hard to believe. He formulates a plan to bring his entire family, including his father, his brother Benjamin, and the families of his other brothers to Egypt. He knows that the famine will only get worse, and he knows that he has the God-given authority to preserve his family through it. So he makes a decision, one that only Joseph can make, to spare his brothers and stop the madness. So here's what happens. After he accuses his brothers of being spies, he has one of his brothers, Simeon, tied up in front of the other brothers. And he tells them that in order to prove that you're not spies, you must leave Simeon here 
take the food back to your family in Canaan, and then return with your youngest brother, Benjamin, the only one of Joseph's brothers that is from his own mother. And look what Genesis tells us the brothers' reactions are. It's in Genesis 42, verse 21. It says, They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against this boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now he must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. Joseph turned away from them and began to weep. Joseph is obviously touched by the recounting of what his brothers had done to him. His emotions get the better of him, and the Bible says he weeps. And I don't know if you've ever heard someone weep, but it's not a single tear sort of response. Weeping is a full flood cry that it's hard to hold back. I like to call it an ugly cry because like your face, it just contorts and it just, you can't control it and you're just crying and weeping and making noises. And that's exactly what happened to Joseph. So Joseph is trying to regain control of himself so that he can respond to what he's heard. After he composes himself, Joseph has all of their bags filled with grain and he has them filled with the food they came to get so they could take it back home. But here's what Joseph also does. He also takes the money, the silver that the brothers used to pay for that food, and puts it back into their bags. So when the brothers find it, they are terrified because they think that they'll not only be seen as spies, but also as thieves. Now, let's fast forward a little bit. Joseph's brothers have returned to Canaan. Remember, they left Simeon back in Egypt. And now they've run out of food again. While they were supposed to go back to Egypt and bring their youngest brother Benjamin with them, Jacob has forbidden it. The father has said, no, no, no. My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. But the food is gone. The family is desperate. And the brothers set off again with Benjamin as tow in tow with a double portion of silver to repay their debt. Benjamin's brother Judah promises their father that he will bring Benjamin back alive. Now, once again, Joseph is in a position of power over his brothers. So what do you think happens? Well, we're told that as soon as the brothers and Benjamin walk into the room, he again breaks into tears. He begins crying over the sight of his brother. This time, it's so bad the tears are so overwhelming that he has to excuse himself from the room. He composes himself again, and he invites his brothers to eat lunch with him and then sends them off yet again with food and silver, except this time, he also slips his own personal silver cup into Benjamin's sack. Now, I think Joseph's having a little bit of fun here. He's, he's playing a couple of games with his brothers because listen to what happens. So the brothers set out as they're on, on their way back home. And as they're on their way out, they're approached by one of Joseph's servants who accuses them of stealing the master's silver cup. How ironic. This wasn't orchestrated at all. The brothers are all stunned. The servant tells them that whoever has the cup must become Joseph's slave. Now, imagine their shock when the cup is found in Benjamin's bag. The one whom their father Jacob was reluctant to let go on this trip. The one who the father Jacob said, if he does not return home or if he's dead, I'm going to die because of sorrow and grief. And that's the one who had the cup. So they are almost home with both Simeon and Benjamin, the son that they had sworn to protect, as well as all the food that they went to eat or went to get, and they are told they must go back to the city so that Benjamin can become Big Z's personal slave. Are you starting to get a little weary with this going back and forth yet? Are, are you sensing Joseph setting up this big, extreme, makeover, home edition, or weight loss, whichever you prefer, type reveal? 
Do you notice that each time the brothers come back to Joseph, they are more desperate than before? Now, some of you might be asking the question, well, why didn't Joseph just reveal who he was the first time he saw his brothers? Well, Genesis 42.9 says that Joseph remembered his dreams about his brothers. And remember, his dream had all his brothers in one place bowing down, right? Joseph realizes that all that has happened to him is part of God's plan, and he submits to it. He has a multitude of opportunities to pay them back for what they have done, yet he decides to stop the madness and follow God's plan. So when the brothers get back to Joseph, they beg for Benjamin's life, telling Joseph that their elderly father will not be able to survive and live through the pain of losing another son. And finally, in an emotional outburst so strong that Joseph has to send everyone out of the room except for his brothers, he tells his brothers who he is, and he tells them not to be afraid. He tells them that all that has happened within their odd family has been a blessing from God to preserve for them a remnant on earth and to save their lives by a great deliverance. And I love what he says next in Genesis 45, verse 8. He says, So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He lets them know that though their actions sent him to Egypt, it was God who actually planned it and used it for good. God has put Joseph exactly as he was, exactly where he was, exactly when he was, for a reason. And Joseph knew this. In the heat of the moment when Joseph could decide how he would respond to his brothers, the brothers who had abandoned him, who had left him for dead, who had lied to their father, Joseph acted in kindness. And his story, instead of being one of revenge, was one of healing and redemption. Joseph was able to do what only Joseph could do. Joseph realized that God has placed him in this situation and in this family. And all of what happened in his family, while it may have been painful and confusing, did not happen by chance. So Joseph, in the midst of dysfunction, decided to do what only he could do. He offered his brothers what they didn't deserve, but what they needed the most. He offered them forgiveness and kindness, and a second chance. And listen, I know some of you are thinking, but Matt, you don't know my family. You don't know what they have done to me. You don't know what's going on. You don't know our history. And you're right, I, I don't. I don't know all that's going on in your family. I don't know all of your anger and frustration. I don't know all of the brokenness and pain. And I'm even willing to give you the fact that a lot of it's probably not even your fault. But here's what I think is true. More than who is right or wrong or who is at fault, God cares about your role in that family. He cares more about how you react. He cares more about how you respond and what action you're going to take to fix the way things are. And that's because we don't get to decide how our families respond to life. But we do have control over ourselves. And I feel like I need to say this too. If right now your family is a dangerous place, if it's abusive, if you don't feel safe, I'm not saying you should stick around in that situation and we would, be, we would try to help you as any way we can. You need to get out. And if your family is taking advantage of you in some way, it's not healthy for you, nor is it okay. But maybe you're able to pray for them. Maybe at some point you're able to forgive them. Because, listen, you could be the only person who is able to do that for your family. And next week, we're going to be talking about situations like that. What happens when you have done all that you can do, but it doesn't seem to help? So I invite you to come back and be part of that discussion. Will you stand with me? Journey, I know that... This may scare you to death, but God has given you the power to change the culture of your family. Your family may not be perfect, but the good news is that none are. And God intentionally created you the way you are and placed you where you are to do what only you can do. Joseph could have let his circumstances beat him down. He could have given up or run away. He could have sought what many people would have deemed fair, but he could have sought revenge on an epic scale. 
However, he made the decision to function in the dysfunction and remain faithful. But that was the unique position that Joseph was in. But what does that look like for you? Imagine what your family could look like if you decided that God placed you in the family you're in for a purpose. What would happen if you decided to function in the dysfunction and do what only you can do? I believe we could bring change to our family. And if anything is going to change, at some point, somebody has to start the change. And the power lies with you. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so thankful to be able to bow down to you and call you our Father. We know that you are the perfect, loving, second, or heavenly Father that we have. And we talk about uh, Joseph offering his family a second chance and offering them what they didn't deserve but needed the most. And Lord, we know that's true of you in our lives, that you offer us what we don't deserve all the time. And Father, I pray that we would be able to represent you in our families, that we would be gracious, that we would be forgiving, but that we would be wise and safe as well. Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to know and see our role in our families understanding that we are there in a purpose uniquely gifted to do what only we can do, but that you would also give us the courage and boldness to say the things and do the things that need to be said and need to be done. And Father, at the end of the day, we trust you. So Father, I pray you'd begin to change in us and work in us from the inside out. And Father, we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.